poi Menion per pezione il recupero va dietro la schiena per servire Aia. il marchio di Gallinari che si intu Gallinari il canestro di Vitazze non è valido ma Gallinari ai, ha sentito ai, qualcosa ai. al ginocchio sì. sinistro e chiaramente con la iperestensione sì, sì, sì. Eh, Quindi non mi sembra che ci sia il contatto del, con Busa eccolo qua guarda il, corso, il passaggio Aia no si sì, si è fatto male forse proprio da solo come dici tu una piccola iperestensione sì, sì, sì. Eh, Quindi non mi sembra che ci sia YouTube, how's everyone doing? Jags to Riches, James Peters, thank you all so much for your time. So good to see you all. Been a couple of weeks. Hope everyone is kicking ass in whatever they're doing in this thing that we call life. Really good to see you all. Hope everyone really is doing good, having a great weekend. Uh, essentially, I want to say I took last week off. So far, guys, this offseason been trying to provide a weekly update. However, you know, it kind of had dried out. When I went to make the video last week, the only real thing going on was the schedule and Kevin Durant. So I was just kind of at this point where I was like, the hell with this. You know, I, I'm, I cannot make another damn video, you know, and go into detail about KD until a trade happens or until it's over is, is literally what I've been saying. So, um, you know, taking that little break is kind of refreshing and it also provided some good you know, additional stories and some topics. I almost dropped the video yesterday and I'm glad I didn't because obviously today, um, you know, a really big story breaking as well. So what we're going to do, obviously go over some of the Boston Celtics news, look around the NBA, touch on some of the, um, the bigger stories around the league. And then finally, bury and put to bed this Kevin Durant saga. Is it over? And, uh, we will also glance at the schedule, you know, to see some of the uh, key takeaways, not spend, you know, too, too much time on it. But um, unfortunately, guys, you know where we have to start with this video and it, you know, as of today, you see at the beginning of the video, the opening clip, Danilo Gallinari recently signed this offseason for the Boston Celtics appears to have suffered a major knee injury while playing overseas in Italy. And it's disappointing because earlier this week, he had just scored a thousand points. I was seeing it on Twitter, him being celebrated. And it just seemed like on a fast break, he um, went, you know, doing a Euro step and a non-contact injury. You can see when you just type in his name, there's a couple conflicting stories. I mean, right off the bat, look, Yahoo Sports, an hour apart. One article, it says, Gallo feared to have suffered serious knee injury. The other one right here says uh, scary knee injury. Early reports are good. So in my opinion, you know, well, first, before we even get to that, I mean, Gallo was signed this offseason. As you all know, this is a gentleman who has played, you know, I mean, he's 34, turning 35 years old is a guy that has played with multiple organizations, including Denver, obviously La the Clippers, you know, OKC. Last year, he was with Atlanta. And actually, these past two years, coming off the bench, averaging about, you know, 12 points, five rebounds. He's a basically a career 40% from three. I think three out of the last four years, he shot like four, over 40% from three. And I mean, this is a guy, again, who coming into this team, he was bought out by San Antonio and just provided what we really did. Like he really addressed a huge need for us with just points and scoring off the bench. A guy that's six foot ten, who's averaged essentially between twelve and twenty points his entire career, and again has a forty percent three point shooter, to provide that type of stretch and that a veteran. I mean, it's just he really is. I was looking at um his game log and just like to end last season i think it was four out of his last regular season games or something like that four out of the eight so i think he scored between 26 27 points so i mean this is a guy that can just light it up on the offensive end and again i think provided you know really helped answer our two biggest well two of our biggest needs and you know what we needed to address this offseason which was just overall depth and bench scoring so I'm no damn doctor, guys. I have no idea. I mean, just looking at it in my, 
to my eye, it does seem like this is going to be one of those injuries. From what I'm seeing, it's saying that his ACL is still intact. Thank God, that's a big deal. But it's still, if this is even a severe sprain or one of the other MCL, I don't really know. We'll have to wait on these additional reports. I think he's going to have an MRI or something like that tomorrow. So we'll get the additional information. But just um, <clears throat> if I had to guess, I would say best case scenario. Well, I mean, best case, best case, he's back tomorrow. But um, realistically, this is probably best case, something where he's out maybe two to three months, you know, putting him back maybe in the December-ish ballpark. I would say worst case and probably what we're looking at is going to be like a four to six month type rehab. So he's probably going to be coming back, in my opinion, all star break, trade deadline, February, January, February. And again, that's probably worst case. So I would put him in that three to six month ballpark, which, you know, it is what it is. It's one of those things where a positive we're not losing him for the entire year we're going to speak on another gentleman who is out for the entire season without even playing you know an a minute so again we he will be back at some point you know some of the negatives obviously as we've seen the importance of you know just playing with this team getting some minutes and some repetition under your belt it, it was i mean the team as a whole slow start to last season you could say the same thing for guys like when Derek white came over at the trade deadline it kind of takes a little bit of time to get going in ema system and what this team is trying to do just because it's different than what most are used to so i mean again it will be one of those things he's like i said a 34 35 year old vet that is also kind of concerning he's a guy who's had multiple serious knee injuries in the past uh, so we'll have to see how the recovery is for him but um Again, he's someone who should be able to, uh, you know, it shouldn't take him too much time to actually get going once he has returned, especially because he has one of those games where he's just kind of like a lights out, you know, shooter, not somebody we need doing too much crazy shit. And he was in that eight, nine. Again, the Celtics have a nasty, nasty rotation right now. When you look at just one through nine, I would argue the best in the NBA. I mean, there might be teams out there with a better six, you know, one through six or one through seven. But when you look at the nine man rotation of Marcus Smart, Brogdon, Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, Al Horford, Rob Williams, Grant Williams, Danilo Gallinari. I mean, who am I missing? Did I say Al? So again, Marcus Smart, the Jays, Al Horford, Rob Williams. Oh, excuse me. It was Derek White. I was missing Brogdon, Derek White. Gallo, Grant Williams, like that nine man rotation is pretty damn impressive. So he would probably be right in that eight, nine with Grant, because obviously you got Brogdon in the six with, you know, Derek White in the seven and then Grant and Gallo. So looking at it, it's not worst case. It's not like, oh, my God, because this is a gentleman who will be back at some point in this season we can look at it like he'll be what Derek was what Derek white was last year maybe like a trade deadline you know addition that could give us a spark once he gets going he should have plenty of time to get his legs under him get some run with this team prior to the playoffs and honestly that's what it's all about in the meantime I think it's on you know Grant Williams to take another step this season which I I anticipate he will just like last year I mean Coming into the season, he was on the chopping block. And now, you know, I mean, he's one of the better 3 and D, 40% three-point shooters. I mean, he he was special. And I expect him to take that next step. And this will be a big opportunity for him, you know, because he'll be that – him and Gallo essentially playing similar roles, however, with different skill sets. Grant more defense, Gallo more offense, both of them 40% three-point shooters. So we need him to step up, obviously – you're going to have Brogdon, White. They were already going to get big minutes. And then just some of the other guys, Peyton Pritchard. But I would say this is also put some uh, importance on who else they bring in, right? We've already talked about some of the additional big men and some of the guys out there. And it still seems to be kind of, you know, stagnant and just kind of just waiting to see what happens. I haven't heard of any of like the Montrez Heralds or Aldridge or Whiteside. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I haven't heard of any of those guys getting signed yet. But, uh, some other additions we've heard coming in on training camps because remember right now it's they brought in Noah Vonley and um, um, Bruno Capoclo so two bigs but in addition I hear Broderick Thomas will be coming back as well as uh, Denzel Valentine so 
couple of training camp invites. We still have several, I believe, open roster spots anyway. So I think that um, this injury does put a little bit more importance on who we bring in, especially to, you know, just for the start of the season to provide. Because say what you want about Gallo. He is still 6'10", probably, what, 240. I mean, that's some size that we were losing in a position we were already kind of thin at when you really think of only having Rob, Al. And then after that, it's like, so... We'll just have to wait and see. Remember, this team is over the tax. So, you know, money, and I know, I know, God forgive, I know how that is with the billionaire's money, but they unfortunately will be looking at it. So um, we'll have to just wait and see, guys. But again, expect Gallo out, you know, at the beginning of this season. And hopefully he returns at some point, you know, early, you know, late 22, early 23. Uh, some of the other things going on, uh, like I said, speaking of a major injury, so we had Jason Tatum, who recently played in the uh, crossover with uh, in, with Jamal Crawford. A lot of play, a lot of players were out there. You had LeBron, uh, I think Dejounte Murray, Paulo Blant. I mean, there was a bunch. But the story is about unfortunate Chet Holmgren, number two overall pick at OKC, ended up having, I believe, an injury to his foot. Was it a Liz Frank? I apologize. Uh, I don't know the actual specifics on it, but. The young man is going to miss the entirety of his rookie year. Very disappointing, especially after the performance that he put on for Summer League and a lot of the hype he had coming into the year. And I know a lot of people were already kind of questioning his ability, you know, based on his frame on will he be able to stay healthy? And this is just kind of unfortunate because it's just going to put additional fuel to their fire when in reality, this is uh, from what I'm hearing, just one of those freak ass injuries. And he actually got it in attempting to block LeBron James' shit. And he actually did, um, you know, affect the shot. He missed it. But uh, just kind of sucks for this young man. So I'm hoping him a speedy recovery. He's got such a beautiful, awesome game. It's, you know, hopefully his frame does fill out. And hopefully he can, um, you know, get back on track. You know, so anyways, looking out. Um, speaking of that, excuse me. <clears throat> Speaking of injuries and the crossover, Jason Tatum actually doing that interview recently where he was saying he damn near was playing with a fractured wrist. So injuries all over the place. And, you know, when you're talking about people at a professional level, there's always, you know, something going on. You know, it's uh, I'm a big UFC fan and you hear every fighter say that they're never at 100 percent. I said I, I would say the same for any professional athlete. But when you hear like a fracture, I remember I have on. Um, so I have a I fractured my hand. And I've had a few surgeries on that. And I remember going a while before I actually had the surgery and just having a, like a day to day with a fracture, especially in this area, like where he's talking about, it's just so damn uncomfortable. A lot of your normal movements are suppressed. It's just, I mean, and, and then you're talking about playing at a professional level on a damn NBA finals run. Lord have mercy, Tatum, how sweet it is to be 23, 24 again. But still, man, that's, um, it's extremely impressive, especially when you look at um, his overall performance heading into the playoff or throughout the playoffs heading into the finals. You know, I mean, he, he was the damn uh, Larry Bird um, MVP winner of the ECF final. I mean, it's Jason Tatum, first team all NBA. So, again, offseason, first one he's had in a while when you really think of some, you know, extended time off after coming off of. You know that gold medal and I, I mean he's just he needs some rest recovery some r and r so you know get healthy to gallo to chet to freaking tatum to everyone else and uh, some other things around the league the only other story i'll talk on real quick is pat beverly obviously he was traded trader danny sending out <clears throat> pat bev to the lakers for taylor horton tucker and stanley johnson i believe now very interesting because of the history with pat bev and Russell Westbrook, LeBron James, everyone, you know, Pat Bev's a menace. But he's also said that if he was on that Lakers team, they would have gone to the finals or Western Conference finals, same roster. But more importantly to me, it kind of makes me think, well, what does this mean for Russell Westbrook? You know, is he out the door? You've heard a few different kind of interesting trades. I heard Indiana and Utah, I believe. I heard Indiana, Buddy Heald and Miles Turner for Russell Westbrook. And then I think it was with um, Utah. It was something like Jordan Clarkson, Mike Conley, and Boyan Bogdanovich or something like that. 
I'm not exactly sure why Indiana would want to do that. I know Russ only has one year left on his contract, but why bring in another point guard to a place that already has like Halliburton, Chris Duarte, the gentleman they just drafted? It's kind of like one of those things like, eh. I guess going to Utah makes a little bit more sense. Danny would only have him for one year. Uh, put some seats in the dam, you know, sell some tickets, even though that's kind of funny because that's where he had that one beef with that one guy who um, he got banned, that lifetime ban when the guy, the fan was telling him to get on his knees or some shit like that. But uh, I would say um, <clears throat> very interesting to see what happens with Russell Westbrook. It already was interesting, but it seems like as soon as what we're about to talk about next happened, the Lakers immediately went out and got another point guard. And of course, that is the uh, KD saga coming to an end. So, as you all know, this has been one of those damn things that started literally the beginning of July, I think into June, early July, where Kevin Durant came out and officially requested a trade. I have covered this damn thing throughout, as every other damn NBA channel and Celtics channel has. Uh, it just, it took over the NBA by storm, and it literally, it seemed to put a hold on everything else, like... The Donovan Mitchell trade basically went on a whole. I mean, it's just like every other major move just kind of seemed to, you know, be pressed pause. But um, again, this is one of those things where we waited for several weeks. There was multiple teams that were involved. Celtics, Heat, Suns, early favorites were like the Suns. And then obviously the whole DeAndre Ayton thing where he was going to go to the Pacers. Then he ended up going back to the Suns. So it took them out. And then it's just... Then the Celtics get heavily involved because of some idiot who leaked some shit weeks later, which actually that was more so on the whole Brooklyn side or the KD side, seeming like, well, talks have kind of getting a little, uh, you know, they were trying to essentially reignite talks while also, you know, spicing up the overall value of the trade by saying, you know, oh, it was Jalen Brown that was offered. So then at the beginning of August, so you're talking a month later, he has that initial meeting with Nets ownership where everyone thinks he's going in there to make peace. No, he literally doubles down and says, not only does he want to be, well, basically you're going to, if you want me to stay, you need to get rid of again, um, the head coach and GM. So Mark and Steve Nash got to go. And of course, I mean, you can't give that player that type of power, whoever it is. So Nets ownership backs up their management. And then we waited, obviously, you know, several more weeks until five days ago when Kevin Durant met with both, I guess, all of them again, the ownership and essentially, and, you know, Nash, Sean, Mar whoever, you know, all the important people, all the people that are, you know, making decisions in Brooklyn. They had another meeting with Katie and it seems like the saga has finally come to an end as he agrees he will stay in Brooklyn. Now, my initial reaction to that, it's just kind of like, thank God. Like, I am, like, as you all are, I'm just so done with that damn story. This, this, it just, it put the, there was nothing else going on. There was literally, like, no other real storylines. I mean, it just, this was, had the, everyone was fixated on this one bullshit-ass story, which, again, it seemed like it was bullshit from the get-go. It seemed like there was an initial push. Everyone called, did their due diligence, and then, like, backed off. And then all of a sudden, you know, weeks go by. So then some leaks start happening. And then obviously all the drama with the Celtics camp. And you've got all of the damn Celtics fandom screaming, hell no, we want Jalen. But then you got a few of these other, you know, old media like uh, Brian Scalabrini and Cedric Maxwell saying like, no, we, of course, you trade for KD. He's the best in the world. So causing a little bit of friction and turmoil or, you know, the whole disrespect, you know, narrative and storyline started to come out. So I was just at that point where it's like, of course, we're not going to trade Jalen Brown this. And it wasn't just Jalen. They want Marcus Smart, Jalen Brown, multiple picks, Derek White. Like, they want it all. It's like, what are we talking about here? Of course not. We were two wins away from the damn NBA, from a championship. And we added Brogdon and freaking Gallo. Like, what are we doing? So, again, for me, guys, it's just kind of like, no disrespect kevin durant's one of the greatest of all time he is a superstar among superstars hall of famer champion mvp he's everything he's one of the best in the world like for me he's right behind Giannis as the best in the world like but uh that's not a type of move we were already betting favorites before this move like that pretty much says everything you need to hear but uh i'm just i'm just glad it's over for me he's uh 
he's just, he's exactly where he needs to be, right? This isn't that his hometown? That's where he wanted to go. He's still got like just hearing him go back. That's a scary ass team. That's not a team you want to see. I mean, you still got KD, Kyrie. You've got Ben Simmons. Who knows what he's going to be this year? And you've got Kyrie on a contract year. They brought over Royce O'Neal, TJ Warren to also go with some of the other guys, you know, with um, Patty Mills, Joe Harris, Seth Curry. I mean, they've got a decent little squad over there. So I think he's exactly where he needs to be. I mean, pretty much it, guys. And to wrap up, <clears throat> the last thing I just want to mention is the actual schedule itself. So obviously... The official schedule has released for everyone. You know, everyone's kind of going crazy. Prediction time, just kind of going over key stretches, key games. And I figured I might as well do the same. So some of the things that um, jump out to me right off the bat, obviously opening night at home against Philadelphia. That's pretty badass. And then we're on the road against Miami and Orlando. I will be at that Orlando game. I actually might go. Well, no, I'm well, Hey, shit, I'm off Friday and Saturday. Maybe I'll do that. I'll definitely be at the Orlando game. Maybe I'll get Bobby to come down for one of those. But um, just looking at that opening six games in October, you've got Philly, Miami, Orlando, Chicago, Cleveland, and Washington. What's that? Four playoff teams right off the bat with Philly, Miami, Chicago, and Cleveland. Orlando is a really, you know, hungry up and comer. I like that squad a lot, obviously, with, you know, the number one overall pick, Paulo, and then, you know, Wendell Carter, and then Cole Anthony, Jalen Suggs, uh, Franz Wagner, who I think is a stud. I mean, they've got a, a good little, a good team over there. Obviously, Gary Harris, Terrence Ross. So don't sleep on them. And, you know, obviously, starting off the bat with the Sixers and the Heat, that's two powerhouses. But, I would see us easily going, you know, four and two, maybe even five and one. This is a team, like I said, guys, that I think they're my favorites. You know, they were my, as if I was saying that they were my favorites to go and represent the East last year, what do you think I'm going to be saying this year? Right. So, um, some of the other things looking at December is what you're hearing a lot about because it's just extremely intriguing when you think of, you knock out the first Miami game here on the second, and then you go on a six game road trip where you are playing Brooklyn, who now we know has KD, Toronto, and that squad. Then you go to Phoenix, Golden State, and then you play the Clippers and Lakers. That is brutal. But then after that, you have a damn seven game homestand to finish off the rest of the month. So the second, first half of the month, you're on the road, essentially in the second half, you're back, you know, at the garden with Orlando twice, Indiana, Minnesota, Milwaukee on Christmas, Houston and the Clippers. So um, two very interesting stretches there. But uh, the final big takeaway for me, guys, is the fact that there's actually 13 back to backs. Now, why that? Is important is because we've already heard Al Horford will not be playing back to backs, and one of the key potential players to take up some of his major minutes would have been Danilo Gallinari. So, you know, obviously Brogdon is the boom plug and play. I think if anyone misses any time, that'll be the starter. But again, that when you talk about having that nasty set nine man rotation, now all of a sudden it's an eight man rotation. Now all of a sudden on back to backs, that's only a seven man rotation. It makes the Peyton Pritchards of the world and you know, the Luke Cornets and whoever else makes this roster a lot more important. So be very intriguing to see what happens next, guys. You know, uh, kind of in that point where players are starting to resurface, coming back from vacation. So training footage is dropping. Interviews are dropping. It's getting exciting. I mean, you're talking about, what, two months left until the season starts, about a month left before training camp and everything gets going. So... I appreciate you all so much. I will be back next week with another update. Jags to Riches, James Peters, thank you all so much for your time. I hope you have an excellent rest of your weekend, and I will see you soon, guys. Go Celtics.